Well, greetings and welcome to another fantastic episode of the Do Business Better podcast. Got a great guest and topic for you today. We're talking about marketing. We're talking about branding. We're talking about messaging. We're talking about what you do when you sell and promote your services. I have said multiple times throughout my career, a lot of business people, whether it's big business or small business, don't really know what they are selling. And then they go out there and they confuse the customer talking about their widget. They love their widget. They created their widget. Their little widget is... They, they widget the hell out of their the, the market of uh, of their potential customers, and the customer sometimes doesn't care as much about your widget as you do. So I got David Saltzman here. He's the uh, founder and CEO of the Saltzman Group. He's a story brand guide, which we're going to get into that, what that means and why that matters to you. And he's going to help you clarify your marketing, your messaging, and selling what you do, because... I am convinced a lot of folks are really good at doing what they do. They're really good at the product and the, they're really good at the process, but they're pretty shitty at the promotion. So <laughs> here we are. David Saltzman, thanks for being here. Thanks, Damien. Pleasure, pleasure to be here. I appreciate the opportunity to chat a little bit and maybe help people clarify their messages some, because that's what it's all about. Um, I've been doing my own thing for 29 years and I've spoken to organizations from, you know, running the running, you know, from one end of the table to the other. Right. You know, from the funeral directors to the fertilizer manufacturers. Right. Um, and, and always wondered if maybe somehow those two could be put together. Anyway, um, here's the thing. You've been around a long time. You told me before we went on air here uh, a little bit about your background. Give me your background, then bring me to today and how you work doing what you do with clarifying messages. So go ahead and take me back from the kid that was raised in Massachusetts to today. Well, uh, the shortest part of the story was we did some offshore apparel manufacturing with a family business until some otherwise nice folks with automatic weapons shot us out of our factory in El Salvador. And I thought I ought to do something a little bit safer. So I kind of spent 40 something years in the insurance business and wore a variety of hats, including president of a national trade association and lobbying up on the Hill. Um, running a third party administration firm working for a couple of carriers and in the process the the thing that became apparent is that folks do not know how to tell their story they don't know how to get their point across to, to the point you made earlier damien not only are folks not terribly interested in your widget folks do not give a flying fig about your widget they mm -hmm. could care less about your widget they want to know that you understand what their problem is and that you can help them solve that and so over the course of all those years, one of the things, and of course, being an author for the last 35 years and a columnist, you learn that a lot of people can't tell their story. As you, to, as you pointed out, they're great at talking about their process. But you know, to use the old saw, if somebody says to you, Damien, what time is it? The fastest way to lose them as a client is to tell them how the watch works. <laughs> because nobody cares. And so that's what we do. We, we, we look at, uh, as most of your listeners have, a billion websites. And you look at them and you go, gosh, that's pretty. I wonder what the heck those folks do. And if you have, as Forrester and HubSpot now say, between 14 and 17 seconds to capture the attention of somebody who's looking at your website that you want to do business with, and you don't have above the fold a compelling one-line message that says, we understand your problem and we know how to solve it, they're going on to the next person. And that happens every day. I, 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 you and I could sit and, uh, Graham, we've just met over a Zoom call, but I think that you and I could sit and, um, whether it's over Coke's or Coors Banquets and talk about this probably until we ran out of examples, but we'll, we'll keep, we'll keep it as brief as we can for this, uh, purposes of this podcast. Okay. Going straight to that exact thing. I, and I've said it in my books, you know, I, I my, my business book, Do Business Better. I've got another little book called Brutal Truth where it's, my little statements about everything from life, business, relationships, uh, money, whatever. People care about themselves. And you say that, and maybe you got a consulting client like you work with, and you say that, and you're like, yeah, okay. And like, no, no, no. I, I want you to think about this. And one of the most powerful things I've done with my gal that helps me with my marketing or my wife that helps me with my business, think like the client. Think like the client. When they call their looking for a solution, right? They're not looking for you to sell them. They're not looking for what they have a problem, right? Or they have something they need solved. 
And so I said a long time ago, uh, and my wife actually wrote it down. And she says, you know, I, I think that everything I've learned about sales, I've learned from you. So the point I make is sales is very simply understanding a client or a person's problem and positioning yourself as the solution to it. And you say, well, they don't really have a problem. I mean, let's face it. Uh, if you're selling, uh, you, you know, uh, candy bars, nobody has a candy bar shortage problem. But the main thing is you're understanding their needs, their wants, and positioning yourself as a solution. It's very simple, but somehow so difficult for some business people to get. Well, it, and it, it it's a little bit more complicated than that because there are people who do have a candy bar shortage, but to understand why they believe they have a candy bar shortage, you need to kind of get into the storytelling aspect of what we work with clients about. You mentioned story brand which is a book by don miller uh, it's a terrific book i read it and thought i'm the marketing guy i know how to do this and after the third try I called don and said hey can i come down and study with you because there's a lot more to this i'm going to share with you seven pieces of the story theory which is story theory has been going along around for a long time I mean, 38,000 years ago we were painting pictures on cave walls in france um you, one might argue that now we have emojis and so we really haven't actually come that far but that's I'm a not, different I'm not, I'm not sure if you read the average teenager's communication i'm not sure we've come a full hell of a long way away from hieroglyphics because there's uh, some incoherent babble of idks and lols and omgs and then yeah who knows what so and then anyway, you go to emojis you don't even bother using letters who needs letters we'll just use pictures wait mm -hmm. we've done that before that was a couple of millennia ago yeah at any rate I am now going fair warning to ruin the plot of every novel that anybody reads from this point forward I'm going to ruin the plot of any movie that you go and watch from this point forward. So if you don't want that ruined, plug your ears for a second. Story brand is, a, is comprised of taking your client on a journey. And this is why I couldn't just read the book and do it. Executing this is much more complex. And we'll talk about the candy bar shortage in a second. But you start with the main character. And that main character, customer, prospect, whatever, not you, has a need. They express that need at three different psychological levels. External, what they tell their golfing buddies. Internal, what they, what they might tell their, their wife or their kids or whatever, something a little bit closer. And then philosophical. And the reason those three levels are important is because you look at the work of people like Daniel Kahneman and other people who have proven over the years that we do not make decisions with our prefrontal cortex. We think we do, but we don't. We make every decision that we make based on emotion with the amygdala, that little lizard part of our brain way in the back that still is there from the flight and flight years and, and all of the prehistoric times. And by the we, way, the average, the average person uh, thinks we're being calloused or that we're selling people short. Decisions are made emotionally and then sometimes backed up logically. Correct. Oftentimes not even, oftentimes not even backed up logically. That's decisions correct. But when they are... Emotionally. They're rationalized by our prefrontal cortex, and we've gotten really great at doing that. At any rate, once you, once you expose those three problems, then you, have, you understand what the client's need is. And if the client is hungry or is having a sugar fixation, then in their brain, at least in the emotional part, they're having a candy bar shortage. But be that as it may, they then look for a guide. And the guide is somebody who establishes empathy and authority and says, hey, I've been here before. I know how to help you out. The guide gives them a simple plan, a call to action, perhaps two calls to action, an immediate call to action, and a secondary call to action, as in, A, I want to go on a date, or B, I'd really like to learn more about you. Mm -hmm. And then the guide paints the picture of what the future is going to look like if the plan is followed, or if the plan isn't followed, and what that will look like, and that kind of unpretty picture. And so if you take all of those seven elements, the place, the singular place where most people fall down, even if they understand all of this, is they think they're the main character in the story and not the guide. Mm -hmm. So what you want to do is you want to be Yoda, not Luke Skywalker. Mm -hmm. right. And that's where you start inviting a client to create a story that's theirs. Anybody listening to the podcast has ever spoken to a C-suite level person, for example, Sometimes you're, you're just in the zone and you know you're hitting it out of the park and you look at your prospect's eyes and they're elsewhere. And that's because you've just come in as the hero of the story, of, as the main character. And, you know, for C-suite folks, they're possessed of healthy egos, shall we say, and a lot of them earned them and should have them. And they don't want somebody else on a white horse. That's their position. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's what all of this is about. Once you understand that narrative, 
then we condense it down into a two page script, then we condense it down even further into a one liner, which can be one lines or, or two lines, but that's that one liner then informs every single thing that you do. So example, some of your listeners may be over 65 as or approaching 65 as we're recording this, it's annual Medicare open enrollment period. Okay. You get tons of literature in your mailbox. And I mean that literally, I remember when I was turning 65, tons of literature, you see zillions of commercials. They are confusing as all get out because they don't speak to the one thing that I'm afraid of as a senior. And that's making the wrong decision. Yeah, or, or, or quite simply being uninsured or being uh, at risk. It's as simple as that. But instead they say things like it's open enrollment form 37 dash B says this and blah, blah. And like, how the hell do I make sense of any of this? Right. Right. Um, so. And that's the key is to make sense of it. And the story is a sense making device. It helps you allocate the characters into a place and a time and a journey. You said something really interesting there, David, that you wanted to make, you want to make sure that people know that it's the story and it's about the client. Mm -hmm. I, um, and I work a lot in agriculture and for God's sakes, I go to these agricultural conferences where I speak and then I'll follow some, I'm not being mean, but it's always the same thing. It's a 30 year old girl who um, is a uh, farm wife in from Nebraska and she's got a bunch of Instagram followers and so she gets up and talks about how we need to go online and tell our story, tell our story, tell our story. And I'm like they end up having a huge following of other people that are exactly like her. Never is it a huge following of customers. And then I get up on stage and I say, let me tell you something real quickly here. I'm uh, all about agriculture. And I mean, I own farm ground and I'm my degree is in agricultural economics. I'm a farm guy, but let me tell you what I hear too much. Tell our story, tell our story. You think that the customer gives a shit about you and um, your, your pigs or your cornfields. And I said, I'm not being mean here, but those customers care about themselves. Your story only matters if it makes them feel good about their story. If it makes them, I shop for this because I care about my family, blah, blah, blah. That's what the customer cares about. And it's really difficult for me, David, because so many of my ag people think tell your story means go and tell everybody about you. And like, that's fine. Go and do that. But when a customer goes to a grocery store, they are doing it for their own benefit, not for your benefit. I'll share a story that illustrates that I think pretty well. About a year and a half ago, I didn't have any available time to, to work with clients. I was full up. The problem was scaling, as you know, a, a one man shop sometimes. Um, but it was a friend and he called and needed help. And I said, well, I can't work with you right now, but maybe after the first year. And he said, well, OK, we booked a half an hour for the call. So if we were going to work together, where would you start? And I said, your website. And he said, oh, cool. I said, um, what's wrong with our website? I said, it's terrible. <laughs> and there was a long pause and he said, OK, can you tell me which section of it is terrible? I said, nope. He said, well, how can you say it's terrible, but you can't tell me which section? I said, because I've never looked at your website. He said, well, how can you tell me it's terrible and you've never looked at my website? I said, because I can tell you what's on your website. And I recited to him, given his industry, what I guessed was on his website. Yeah. And it was all about their company and the products that they sold and how their team was excellent and who trained them and how long they've been in business. And I said, the bottom line is nobody cares about that. He said, well, but, but we care about it. I said, then put in a corporate brochure and mail it to a client before your appointment. What the client wants to know is we understand their problem and we can solve it. And if you don't see that, as I said before, above the fold in a website, just the piece that you just see on your website when you first log in, they're gone. And that story is never, ever about you. Right. It's always about the client. Yeah. So dig this. Um, it's then the person's going because I, I look at this all the time, and I work companies I work for and with, and um, I have another side uh, side job. I record video content uh, for Extreme Ag, which is an uh, agricultural organization uh, directly, uh, you know, in the line of improving large, forward thinking farmers' output and and whatnot, improving their businesses. So you work with this company and they say, oh, we'd like you to talk about our, and you go to the, and I can, I can about go to 10 different companies' websites. Mm -hmm. And frankly, there's not a whole heck of a lot of difference from this one to this one to this one. And it's usually the same fluffy, puffy stuff. Um, 
we're this, we're a global leader in this industry uh, with forward thinking. And then when they start using the same corporate vernacular, forward thinking, we're going to lean into changes and um, uh, sustainability and this whole thing. I'm like, I don't know what the hell you do. I still exactly. I looked at this. I don't know what you do or more importantly, what you do for me. David, help me out here. I started seeing this 20 years ago when I was working with companies and they would have changed their names from Anderson Consulting, a global corporate consulting and, and um, advisory firm, whatever, to Accenture. I'm like, what do they do? It, it got to where 20 years ago, we started changing names to something that sounded forward, the new millennium. I'm like, the name you had told me what you did and probably what you would do for me. Now you've changed it to something that your marketing people said was a brilliant idea. What the hell do you do? Am well, I you right changed it to something that your marketing people told you was a brilliant idea. And to your point, you've got all of this corporate gobbledygook speak right on your website. And we call those, in my business, we call those MEGO websites, M-E-G-O. It stands for my eyes glaze over. <laughs> I thought you meant that it was all about feeding their own ego, but real, reality is, and, and, you know, and I, listeners to this generally are probably small biz, biz people, biz owners, gig employees. And, and they're saying, I don't know if that applies to me. Well, you know, it probably does. If you have too much of this, let's call it what it is, corporate babble speak, uh, you know, a global leader and transforming and transitioning into uh, sustainable resources with um, outcomes and stakeholders and pivots. <laughs> and it, it's like, well, I, I still don't understand what you do. And I certainly don't understand what you do for me. Well, and what's worse is what I don't see is that you understand my problem right. and that you have a way to solve it. That's all to the point that you made when we first started. That's all prospects and clients care about. And that's why, as I described the story brand process, we start with a much broader canvas and then we compress that down and compress that down and compress that down until we get to a one liner. And the reason for that is that it is the most difficult task in the world to get folks to crystallize in just a sentence or two what it is they do for a client. It is the hardest thing to pull out of them. All the other seven elements that I express to you, not easy sometimes, but doable. But getting them to not come forth with three paragraphs of babble speak is virtually impossible because they think that's what's expected of them. And I'll tell you something about folks who sell that way. They have skinny kids. <laughs> so dig this. A long time ago, a guy that uh, Sharp Dude, he wrote the forward to my book, um, said, uh, if you can describe what you do in one sentence, that's what you need to be able to do. Because it's so often, if you approach that company and said, Hey, what does XYZ company? That's your company, right? Yeah. What, what is it? What does it do? Well, we're uh, blah, blah, blah. And, and if they start going down to thing, uh, mm -hmm. we create good outcomes for stakeholders. I'm like, I, I don't know what that means. Right. Whereas opposed to we take your uh, ugly backyard and make it a paradise. Oh, okay. <laughs> You're a land. No, we're, we're more than that. We're a design land. You know, whatever. Explain the outcome to the person as opposed, to, as opposed to talking about we create positive outcomes that are sustainable and stakeholder oriented doesn't mean anything, right? Well, but if you put that austerity up front, if you put that economy of language up front, then you have the opportunity, the client will grant you the opportunity to tell more of your story and more about what you can do for them. But if you put all that corporate gobbledygook speak or even just you're not clear, I mean, how many times have you seen a website where you go, that's really awesome. But you still have no idea what the hell they do. Yeah. And I, we see so much of that both in, I'm a copywriter by trade. So we, we see so much of that in written content mm -hmm. um, and, in, and in all of the different ways that companies, whether they're professional corporations or uh, tradespeople or farmers or whatever, when they go to market, they gobble up their mess, they gobbledygook up their message. Nobody understands what they, they do. And then they say, well, let's go on social media. Mm -hmm. um, and for, for your listeners who sell an intangible product, especially, I've, I've got a standing offer. Um, I won't tell you exactly what the bet is, but I've never seen anybody tell me that they can show me a demonstrable, repeatable ROI from any kind of social media. And yet we're all brainwashed now that we've got to be there. We've got, now it's useful. 
It's useful for extending your brand. Mm -hmm. It's useful for showing thought leadership. If you're marketing a book, as you've done a couple of times, you know, it, it, it's useful for that. But that's not a direct sales opportunity. Right. And most of the folks that I work with are folks who sell stuff. We all sell stuff. Frankly, we all sell stuff because if you, if you, I mean, it's if we're all in the business of selling something because there's no revenue if there's not sales. Um, I said in my book that uh, there's, and I said anybody is free to correct me on this, but I believe there's marketing, there's advertising, and there's selling, and they all work together in in some level of unison. We hope, but there are three distinctly different things. I said that marketing is telling the world um, what you do and who you are. Advertising is telling people that can be your customers, meaning it should be targeted, what you can do for them. And then selling is asking those people that can be your customers to be your customers and to give you their, their money. That's how I would say is difference between marketing, advertising, and sales. And I think there's a lot of small business people that don't really, don't really make a difference, or I'm sorry, don't really demarcate a difference between those three things or understand how they must work in unison and they're three different things. And there's a great overall term for that. It, it, the umbrella term is business development, but it includes all, to your point, it includes all three of those elements and it has to, because you've got, you know, you've got a funnel, you've got a customer journey to use the new uh, terminology and the customer's got to come into the top of the funnel someplace and the customer's got to go someplace and the customer's got to end up someplace. David, if you're going to use more of the corporate vernacular that is just jargon, I want you to throw in um, stakeholders a couple of times and then pivots. We got to be talking about pivots. We got to pivot and do some stakeholders. I will do that as long as I get a couple of synergies in. <laughs> synergies, right? <laughs> That's a good '70s word for you. Uh, but it's come back, and because there's a lot of synergies, uh, you know, we're working to create synergies for positive outcomes for um, stakeholders. stakeholders. Right. Got to remember the stakeholders. It's always about the stakeholders. Yes. Um, I've been I've been around. We sound jaded, both of us, because we've been around long enough that we've we've heard them, seen them, uh, suffered from them. Suffer. <laughs> the uh, only time I want to be a stakeholder is at dinner. Yeah, right. Uh, answer me this. I can answer. I can describe uh, all of my many of my offerings in one sentence because you know the person listening is like really can do it. I want to go back to that. What you're talking about again? It's not you. It's making it understandable for the customer making it understandable for the prospective client. And one thing I learned a long time ago, back in my political comedy days, using the familiar to sell the foreign. I had a comedy act 25 years ago and I dressed up as Bill Clinton and delivered political comedy. And it was for corporate meetings. And back when you could still do political comedy at corporate meetings. And the resistance we would face was, when you're trying to get to that next level of charging more and getting better clients, oh no, our group is uh, not political. Oh, our group is Republican. Our group is, they didn't understand it because remember what's, what I think our customers, what our listeners need to understand is you talked about humans make their decisions emotionally. One thing also, they're not visionary. You and I have worked on our own written books. We're probably more creative and visionary. You give me an idea. Mm -hmm. I can look out there and see it. And you can too. Most people are not that way. No offense, they just are not. You give them a brilliant idea. The smartest thing I heard once, and I read it in a business book, um, it was from somebody in show, but it said, don't worry about your brilliant cutting edge idea being stolen from you. If it's a brilliant cutting edge idea, you'll have to cram it down people's throats, let alone, because they won't even understand it, let alone steal it from you. And I've never forgotten that. When I sold political comedy, David, it finally, after a few years, I have figured out, oh, use something they do understand to sell something that they don't understand. What is this Bill Clinton comedy act? I don't understand. It, it, it is Saturday Night Live style humor. Oh, tailored to your organization. Oh, it's about me. Delivered in the persona of Bill Clinton. It took me a couple of years to figure that out, but I took a TV show that's been on since 1975 that everyone in North America has probably heard of, cer certainly heard of and probably seen, all right? They understand Saturday Night Live. They understand tailored to my organization. Oh, it's about me. It's about my group. We like that because he cares about us. And then delivering the persona of Bill Clinton. Oh, that's an interesting hook. He's the president of the United States. You use the familiar 
to then describe and sell that which is foreign. Well, and, and, and you know that that's a great revelation, but it but it's true. I, I'll give you an example. Allstate. They could talk about insurance until your eyes glaze over, which would probably be about 4.3 seconds. But instead, they got this dude named Mayhem because everybody understands mayhem. Yep. And nobody wants to be a victim of mayhem. Yep. How do you do that? Well, you, the nice Dennis Haysbert guy says, you know, come to, to Allstate and get a quote. And then they show you what the future can look like. That's story brand. That's just story theory. But it's, it's to your point, it's using something that's familiar to people. You can, you can out technical anybody on God's green earth, but it doesn't mean you'll end up with a sale. And at the end of the day, if you're a sales organization, the rest of it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how smart they think you are. It doesn't matter how clever they think you are. It matters that they understand that you know what their problem is, that you've had experience solving it, and that you can help them solve it too and paint a greater future picture for them. It's the second time you've said, if you're a sales organization, every organization is a sales organization because unless the organization sells its product or its services, it does not have a purpose, right? So mayhem, let's go back to that one. I think it's really good because you just, you know, I talked about using the familiar to sell the foreign and you just said the exact same thing. I don't understand all the, if you sent me, when you you and I buy insurance policies, holy crap, there's 30 pages of clauses about, uh, you know, acts of God and this and that. But the one thing I know when I see, oh, I know what this guy, I know what this commercial is talking about. I was a distracted driver because there's some crazy thing going on over here and everybody gets distracted. And I just reared and somebody, oh crap, do I have the right insurance? I Now I understood why I need Allstate. You're, you're, you're very spot on about that. Yeah, and that's, that's, that's what we try to do with clients. We try to help them get to that Allstate place. We try to help them get to the, the point where the problem is the client's problem, not theirs. And we say, we know how to fix it. We're the guide. Don't go down that road because that's where the guys with the little throwing stars are and the mean guys with the motorcycles and whatnot. Come on, I know a shortcut. I'm going to take you this way. And then there's another obstacle. And then there's another obstacle. And that's that's what you do as a professional is you help clients avoid those obstacles. David, you uh, and I have spent enough time talking about all the things that folks do wrong. Um, let's let's help uh, the people listening to this. They want to be better at marketing. They want to be better at communicating their, their offering. And I want to reiterate, marketing is telling the world what you do and who you are uh, and, how, and, and what you can do for the client. Advertising is going to the specific people and saying, here's what we can do for you specifically. And we want your business. And then selling is going there and saying, give me your, order. you know, give me your money. Mm -hmm. With that in mind, what can the person listening to this right now that is a small biz, middle-sized biz, small, whatever, self-employed, what can they do to improve their outcomes through better marketing? The starting point is to talk less and listen more. It's to presuppose less and understand more. Um, we, were, we were working with an insurance agency out in the Midwest about a week and a half ago. And they were going in with this huge PowerPoint deck and they were trying to overwhelm people. And I don't know about you, but when I see PowerPoint presentations, I run in the other direction and a lot of people are hooked on them. Um, matter of fact, one of the younger people in an agency said to me, well, when you started your career, how many slides were in your deck? I said, dude, PowerPoint hadn't been invented yet. My, my, personal presentations, my presentations were me and a microphone and right. uh, sometimes- What'd you use? I said, it, was, it was me and a yellow pad and a piece of paper. And I asked two questions. In this particular case, my suggestion to them was two questions. One, why do you have a plan of benefits for your employees? And then listen. And then two, how's your current plan of benefits meeting those expectations? Mm -hmm. We've outcomplicated ourselves. We've overcomplicated ourselves. Mm -hmm. Brevity is the soul of wit, as someone once said. It's also the soul of sales. You need to be brief and to the point. Nobody's got time. We talked about Forrester and their study and HubSpot about how long somebody will stay on a website. It's getting shorter. It's hard to imagine shorter than 13 or 14 or 15 seconds, mm. but it's getting shorter. So you need to, whether you do it yourself or you hire a guide like me or you hire marketing people or whatever you do, you need to hone in on what your client's problem is and how you can convey in as few words as possible how you solve it for them and you will be successful. When you think about um, the companies or the folks that you work with, they're not unsuccessful. In other words, they're not doing poorly. And sometimes it's like, despite 
crappy marketing, despite crappy promotional ideas, you're still succeeding. So how do you tell those people, people that they're doing something wrong when they're when their their business is okay? I've never met a business person who doesn't want more. Mm-hmm. If you are, then it's time to sell your business and go do something that lights you up. Right. If you want more, the status quo won't get you there. That's not, as somebody said to me the other day, that's not rocket surgery to mix a metaphor. That's just common sense. If you do what you always do, everybody say it with me. You'll get, you're what get what you always, always get. get. Right. So ah. if you if you want more, you got to break out of what you're doing today, and you've got to look at things differently. If you're complacent, there's not a whole lot anybody can do for you, frankly. I, uh, I'd say you don't even have to, you know, because people are like, well, I don't really like to be a salesperson. All right. Well, first off, you're, you need revenue. Secondly, we're not saying that um, you need to go full tilt. Probably what mo- uh, my thought is, and I want your thoughts on this. My thoughts are, it's not that hard of a fix. Like you said, start by listening to the clients. I know when I started out, the phone would ring, and I just about just just back when we still used a phone. I'd come through that phone, just sell them, sell them, sell them. And it dawned on me, you know when I got better? When I got better was when I started realizing, wait a minute, I want them to hire me. I want their, I want them to be a client. I'll let them talk. <laughs> let them mm-hmm. tell me what they're, they called me for a reason. They must already think I'm a probable or prospective solution. Right. Instead of me overselling it, let me let them talk. And then I got better when I started realizing that. Our tagline is really simple. It's stop talking, start communicating, sell more. There's a difference between talking and communicating. And that is all the difference in the world. It's the difference, as Mark Twain said, between lightning and the lightning bug. They're very, very different things. And so if we can help clients learn how to communicate better, rather than just showing up with an 80 slide PowerPoint deck that has nothing to do with what the client's real problem is, then we can help them increase sales. And that's what it's all about. Kind of funny. Um, you talked about an insurance agent going in with an 80 deck, 80, 80 slide deck, uh, thinking that that was, and you and I both get paid to get on stages and speak. I have to follow people that are not paid to speak. They're somebody within the company, let's say. And I just followed one the other day and it was 40 slides, do not say 20 slides that had, Oh, I'd say as much copy per slide as a page out of the Wall Street Journal. You couldn't have possibly listened to them and read that. And then the point I always make is, if it's just you're going to stand up there and you're going to read a slide to me, just send me the damn slide. I can read. <laughs> so, and most of our audiences can. Well, it's Einstein said, right? If you, if you can't explain something simply, you don't understand it well enough. If I'm a client or a prospect and I'm looking for a solution, I want somebody who understands my problem well enough. I don't want somebody who's got to dazzle me with tap dancing. I want somebody who says, yeah, I've seen this problem before. I can fix it. Let me show you how. What, um, what do you think, what do you think our, our people that we're talking to, what do you think they get right? Um, I mean, is it that the product is usually right? Is it the product and it's usually the promotion wrong? Or do you think most people are decent at promoting? They just maybe make it too much about themselves. What do you think they get right? And, and most of the time, what do you think they're getting wrong? Some of the most of the time. Well, I think that's a great question. I I think the folks that get stuff right get the passion for what they do right. Okay. Um, As somebody once told me years ago, you know, know your facts and do your homework, but remember it's passion that persuades. But passion will only get you just so far. And I think, you know, you talked about, you know, when your phone rang early on in your career and you had that exuberance and you wanted to just bowl people over with all the different things you knew and all the ways you could help them. That passion will will be infectious and it will cause some sales, Mm -hmm. but it won't help you grow. And growth is what it's all about. We all get into business and can get to a certain level based on blind hogs finding acorns, et cetera, et cetera. But if you want to grow, if you want to have a battle plan that says, okay, we're going to grow 10 percent year over year or 20 percent year over year, you can't rely on passion because it won't get you there. And so that's both, I think, what they do right and what they do wrong. They think that because they had some initial success by being passionate, that that's all they have to do. And so they ramp up that volume. They ramp up the number of slides in their deck. And at some point, whether you're being honest with yourself or not, at some point, they stall. And they don't understand what's gone wrong because they've gotten 
to where they've gotten based on the inertia of their excitement and their passion. And as I said, that only gets you just so far. Right. Yeah. So, um, and, and, and like you said, if you run your business, you should have excitement about it. That's great. That's great. But as you said, at some point it's got to go beyond that. Fundamentally, and I'm getting kind of crazy here. Fundamentally, you know, you just talked about, you didn't have PowerPoints so many years ago. We didn't have the internet. We sure as heck didn't have social media. There's nine new social media platforms in the last, I just had dinner with my buddy and his family and I asked his 15 year old daughter, what social, what apps and social media platforms? Cause I'm always curious. She told me two that I'd never heard of before in my life. That's changed what marketing looks like. Influencer marketing is something that did not exist. Oh, it did. Joe Namath had a, uh, you know, a tourist or luggage, American tourist or luggage commercial back in 1975. So we've had influence marketing before. That's not new. It's just how it's done. Now it's on Instagram as opposed to the, the during the price is right. Um, we, we are in an interesting time where, uh, marketing is advertising messaging is out there more than it's ever been. Is it still effective? For some products in some markets with some demographics, it is. But it becomes part of the cacophony that you need to help a client cut through. One of my yeah. favorite, favorite words, cacophony. One well, of my favorite words. It's because there's nothing else that quite expresses what it is. We say in marketing a lot, we say noise in the marketplace. And cacophony, cacophony is just a tremendous amount of well, distortion and noise. Never use a one syllable word when you can use a three syllable word. I mean, you know, it's it's one of those marketing axioms, like always avoid alliteration. <laughs> All right, go ahead. Um, there's lots of noise. There's lots of clutter. But also, you know, it used to be there's three commercials. It used to be there was a radio. It used to be there was billboards and that was it. There used to be there was billboard and print. And then we went from billboard and print to billboard print radio. They went from billboard print radio TV. Billboard and print uh, and radio did not go away. Then we went to uh, more TV. Then we went to internet. I'm, maybe I'm missing a step or two in there. Um, and social media marketing and influencer marketing. And billboard still exists. Radio still exists. Radio has expanded now, it's satellite radio. And so anyway, there's lots of avenues out there. Do you think that being better at marketing now uh, is going to cut through the clutter? Or do you think maybe it's easier because you've got so many alternatives? I think it's easier for the people who have a very clear, concise message that resonates with the client. Because all of these other things have created so much noise in the marketplace that folks are still going to websites. I mean, when, again, I'll, I'll come back to the same stat. When Forrester and those guys can tell you that somebody looks at a site for 15 seconds and then moves on if they don't see what they want, the implicit point is that they stay if they do find what they want. And that's why things like search engine optimization, while it's sometimes like trying to nail jello to the wall with a staple gun, mm -hmm. it's still something to be considered because you have to understand where your clients are going to find you. For a lot of the other marketing that's out there, it's constant repetition. That's the billboards. That's the TV. I mean, you and I both remember back in the days when you used to buy radio spots and they wouldn't let you buy a single spot. Mm -hmm. You had to buy a package because they knew if you bought a single spot, it wouldn't be effective. Mm -hmm. And regardless of what media you're focusing on, if you do not tell that story in a way that compels the client's emotion to then go and act on it, you're going to starve and it doesn't matter whether it's a billboard or a tv or influence marketing or whatever it is influence mark influencer marketing is great but not for the long haul mm -hmm. <clears throat> makes you wonder uh you know i took a commercial advertising class at purdue way back when and um how much has evolved just since then and uh i am a, I'm a, i guess i'm certainly not as up on it as you but i'm up on it because i'm a student of it i i watch it i probably notice it more than something i notice that i'm being pitched to constantly more maybe than others do um closing thoughts on all this for the person that's listening um give me a wrap up what do they what do they need to know do what do we need to know and do what do you think uh outlook for the future all that well, I think the two things that you need to know and do if you're going to be successful is you need to, as I've said, understand what your client's needs are. 
and understand them on all three levels, external, internal, and philosophical. And then you need to be able to craft a message that puts your client at the center of the message and makes it clear that you're the guide with whom they want to work to solve their problem. As complicated as we've gotten with marketing and business development and all of the other components you and I have talked about, it's not more complicated than that. Unfortunately, simple is not easy. Hmm. <laughs> oh my God. I speak about that. I have a demo reel. Maybe you saw it. Maybe you're sucking up here, David. I have a I have a video demo reel that goes down that exact path. That said, you want to be successful in business? Create a great product or service. Uh, improve it every day. Go out and tell the world what you do. Do a really good job for all your customers. Go and ask those customers for referrals. Ask those customers to tell you, give you testimonials. Put them all over social media. Create a mailing list. Send out marketing. Make sure that your trucks and your cars and your appearance look professional. Uh, every month, analyze your money. Make sure you're investing back into your marketing and promotion, but also investing back into yourself to make yourself better, stronger. I go through all these things that takes me successful. I said, it's all pretty simple, isn't it? But simple don't mean easy because no. <laughs> all that I just said is effort and work. And you got to be forward looking and you've got to look at, and you know what, what companies always do, they know it's simple. They complicate it, make it harder than it is when it already was going to be some work. But then what they do, they start looking down the road at their competition and they're convinced that that's their problem. And so one thing I always tell people is like, your competition, a buddy of mine starting a direct to consumer beef business. And he says, he's talking about Omaha steaks, Omaha steaks. I said, right now your competition is not Omaha steaks. Your competition is zero revenue. Huh? I said, <laughs> Omaha steaks don't give a shit about you and right. you shouldn't care about them. Right now your competition is you have no revenue. Right. Oh. Your competition is you need revenue. And to do that, you need clients, you need a product. I went through all that. Simple, not easy. I just want to. Well, there's two things about competition. Hey, if you want to know who your competition is, go look in a mirror. Because more often than not, you're your competition. You know, it, it, it's, not, it's not difficult. And second, people make the mistake of looking out and looking at their competition and saying, well, I need to be doing what they're doing. And you need to do exactly the opposite. You need to be doing the things that they aren't doing, but should be doing. And that's telling a simple, clear, compelling story that resonates with your clients and gets them to take action to work with you. Maybe it's the best part about being somewhat creative like you and I, you know, you've been a copywriter and, and I've been a comedian. I, I now look at what the competition is doing and say, how can I copy it? You know, the most uninventive and race to the bottom is, well, so-and-so is doing this. We're going to do it, do it cheaper. I'm like, no, what if you don't do that and you continue to try and retain margins? And it's remarkable. I'm going to do what they do and do it cheaper. I'm like, yeah, it, maybe you should do it for free. That'd I'll leave you with this thought. Them. True story. Absolutely true story. Unfortunately, we raise children who are very much like ourselves. And one of my children is more like my wife. And one of my children is more like me. And the one who's like me came in one day. I think she was 13 or 14 years old. And she wanted to do some harebrained thing that her friends were doing. And I said to her, well, if all your friends jumped off a bridge, would you do it? And without not even a second, she looked me square in the eye and said, not again. <laughs> it's good not again you got to be simple and direct all right so we uh we went through that i like your thing Cli understand the client's needs listen 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 uh you said something smart uh external internal philosophical hit that one more time because really what you're talking about there is it's not about you it's not about your story it's about making your story re re work with them and you did that real quick thing external means external is the kind of stuff you tell your buddies gee internal. this really sucks blah 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 Internal. internal is your self-talk. Well, I've got to get over this hurdle because if I don't, you know, blah, blah. And the philosophical talk is it shouldn't be so hard to do this. Mm -hmm. You kind of a universal thought. It shouldn't be so difficult to make this happen. I don't understand why this, why, why everything is so complicated. Mm -hmm. And that's the, that's the piece that hits the emotion. And what did we decide that we can't, we can't say it enough. Okay. Not only do you need to probably change your marketing and make it about your customers, but also make sure that there is an emotionally an emotional tripwire because how do humans make decisions? How do customers make decisions? How do people decide to give you money? They do it. How emotionally? Yeah. hundred percent of the time. And if you want to learn more about that shameless plug, go to the saltsman group.com forward slash download. We've got a really interesting piece called eight secrets of storytelling that will help you start down the path. 
the Saltzman S salt, like the stuff on your table, Z right. man, salt, Z man, Saltzman group, Saltzman group.com is how you'll find him. Uh, you keep up on social media, right? You're out there. I am every place there is to be. <laughs> well, maybe not. I just found out of a, a new app called gas. Uh, so you're probably not on. Gas. I was reading about that this morning, but I'm out of gas because I'm old. So, you know, what there you, go. So you and I both uh, just learned about gas in the last four days. Absolutely. His name is David Saltzman. My name is Damian Mason. This is the Do Business Better podcast. I encourage you to check out Mr. Saltzman. Find him on social media or go to the Saltzman group dot com. Yes. Forward slash download. Got it. Thanks for being here, my friend. Damian, thanks for the invite. It's been a pleasure. Till next time, this is the Do Business Better podcast. 